Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Book Design Options for Self-Publishers. Um, before I hand you over to our talented co-host, I wanted to address some housekeeping items. Um, first off, we're going to be live tweeting this event, and we would love if you joined in on the conversation. Um, you You can do this by using the widget in the right hand uh, side of your uh, console. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the widget at the bottom of your screen. I know a couple of you have already used that, so awesome. Uh, continue to use that. Ask some great questions because we have some great people here to answer them. There is a printable version as well, um, and that has been updated. I know a couple of you had said uh, prior that it, it was a different presentation. It's been updated, so you can now print out the book design template um, presentation and follow along with that, take notes. And keep in mind that we have a webinar every month, um, so be on the lookout on our social media. Um, and then if you are on our newsletter or sign up for our newsletter and you'll be um, you know, told when the next webinar is. And um, without further ado, that's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Robin Cutler. And Robin is um, going to be joined by Joel Friedlander, and we're going to be talking about book design templates. Um, and Robin's been um, pretty much the pioneer of Ingram Spark here at Ingram. Um, and she is just um, really great in the community, in the self-publishing community, um, and we are, are so happy to have her here. Um, Robin, do you want to take over from here? Yeah, thank you, uh, Kristen, so much. And um, and the other thing I wanted to remind everybody of is uh, we are recording this session, um, so we will provide that recording to uh, each of you after uh, this session is over. So if it feels like we're going a little fast, you will have the opportunity to go back and review this um, at your leisure. So um, anyway, I've, uh, as, as Kristen said, I am the business owner of the Ingram Spark program at Ingram, and we're really happy and thrilled today to have Joel Freelander here with us. Joel is, um, I, I would say, a thought leader in terms of uh, anything related to indie publishing, self-publishing, um, he uh, has really carved out a lot of um, really great information and, and has written books um, on uh, not only book design but also self-publishing in general. Uh, he knows a lot and has um, recently launched a marketing toolkit that, that's just phenomenal. Um, and I'm just really, really thrilled to have him with us today. He's one of the foremost um, bloggers that you'll see uh, in self-publishing and, uh, and does a lot of conferences as well. So, uh, Joel, we're happy to uh, have you with us. Well, thank you, Robin. That was really a lovely introduction. And I want to thank everyone at Ingram Spark, uh, Robin and her whole team there, for inviting me to come on and talk about book design. Hey, I love book design. I've been doing book design for many, many years. And for those people who don't know, uh, Robin, who you just heard from, is also a former book designer. So I expect <laughs> she's going to chime in here as we go along because she has a lot of experience in this area. So, uh, you know, Thanks. the purpose of today's... Yeah, go ahead, Robin. No, I was just going to say thank you. and. Um, and, and also, um, and also to point out that Joel, uh, he he's on the cutting edge of you know all of this uh, self publishing and, and where self publishing is going in the industry. When we first launched Ingram Spark, he was the the first person that I really had an interview with, and um, and it's because you knew you know what Ingram Spark could be and should be, and he was very good about telling me uh, things that we could improve about the program. And so we took a lot of the suggestions that he ha that he offered and uh, actually made changes uh, really early on. So I thank you, Joel, for, for helping us uh, at the very beginning when we launched SMART. Well, that's fantastic, Robin. And yeah, I recognized instantly the, um, the opportunity that SPARC represented for independent publishers. 
uh, to be able to get into the uh, Ingram universe, into the Ingram feed that goes out to uh, all of those uh, partners that Ingram has all over the world. I mean, that is phenomenal. And um, I just want to say that, you know, the rap against self-publishing for many years, and I, uh, this is going back, you know, decades for me. I'm not going to tell you how many. But um, <laughs> the rap always was that self-publishers, you know, you could produce a great book, but you couldn't get distribution. And that is what is changing now, and it's changing in many ways. And, and part of that is the initiative that Ingram took to set up Ingram Spark, uh, specifically to service uh, self-publishing authors. And I think that's fantastic. And I've been very excited to see uh, Spark grow and uh, have a, a really significant place in the universe. It's not a small undertaking, and people who know book publishing know that our whole book distribution system is really slanted towards large publishers. So to have a facility like Spark that's totally dedicated to indie authors is just uh, fantastic. So you want to talk about books? <laughs> Let's talk about books. You know, uh, really the purpose of this presentation was to give a kind of a high-level overview of what kind of options uh, authors are looking at when it comes time to produce the book. I mean, we know about writing the book, editing the book, marketing the book, but there comes a time when you actually have to confront the fact that you have to actually create and produce a book, and you may not have a lot of experience at doing that. That makes sense. Most self-publishers are doing something else with their day job, and uh, they're publishing either as a hobby or as an attempt to uh, establish a career for themselves, uh, to spread the word about a message they have, whatever the reason is. So how do you deal with this somewhat technical subject of putting together a book? You know, books are uh, commonplace objects. Most of us were introduced to books before we could read because our parents or caregiver was reading them to us. So they seem really simple. Uh, nothing is more prosaic than a book. It's got words on a page, and you read them, and you turn the page. Come on, how complicated could it be? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, when you actually come down to actually create a book yourself, you start to realize there are just dozens of little tiny decisions you have to make. So I'm looking at the overview today. We are. I'm going to talk for about 30 seconds about cover design, and then we're going to look into interior book design, what it's about, what its aims are, and how we can meet those. And then we'll see what kind of options you have. So I am clicking book design for self-publishers. And this really does state it. The aim of book design is to turn your manuscript, what you wrote, into an industry standard book that your readers will love. That statement is pretty densely packed with information. And we're going to unpack this statement during this webinar. So try to remember, the aim of book design is to turn your manuscript into an industry standard book that your readers will love. That's what we want, right, as authors. I'm an author, too. I want people to uh, pick up my books, be very comfortable with them, and get right into what I'm saying. Uh, and, and that's the whole purpose, is to facilitate the communication between the author and the reader. So I need to say a word about book covers because we can't talk about book design without talking about book covers. Book covers are really an important part of the whole launch and marketing uh, and uh, the whole branding of your book. You know, the book cover is the diametrical opposite of the book interior. The book cover is like, uh, you know, that kid who wants to get attention has got their hand raised all the time, no matter what the question is, call on me, call on me, look at me. We're trying to get attention. There's a, just a ton of books. Some people call it a tsunami of books coming at people. And so the cover is really vital. It's a, your prime, prime marketing tool, okay? And because it's so important, it's really a good idea to, to, to realize that you need to put the best cover you can on your book. And unless you are a graphic designer or somebody who really comes to this with a lot of experience, uh, I, my recommendation is hire a professional book cover designer. 
in today's world, uh, we have many book cover designers who would be happy to design a beautiful cover for your book, and the price ranges are, are very wide. Just about any author can find a cover designer who will do the book cover for them at a price they can afford. That's it. That's all I'm going to say about book covers. So let's talk about book interiors. Now what I've done here is, uh, and this is the basic uh, structure for what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to look at what, what is it that we want from the inside of the book. Now many people consider book interiors kind of a commodity, like, well, does it really matter, you know, what font you use or where you put the page numbers or stuff like that. But these are very specific goals that we want to get from the book interior. It has to be very readable. It has to let the reader know where they are in the book. That can frequently be important, and that's particularly important in nonfiction books. Also in nonfiction, we need the way the book is laid out and designed and, uh, and organized to clearly show the hierarchy of knowledge within the book. And I'll show you a little bit more about that as we get to that stage. We want to make sure that resources that are included in the book are really easy to find and access. We want to make sure that the um, interior accommodates uh, elements that aren't part of the actual text of the book. They're, I call them extra textural. That's really hard to say. Probably should come up with a better term for that. Uh, we need to conform to industry standards. That's part of my main statement there, and that's really important. We'll talk more about that. And then, obviously, we need the books are physical objects. They're created by book manufacturers like Ingram and other people. They have to meet the production imperatives of the person who's going to produce the book. That just makes sense. So these are the seven um, goals that I've isolated that our book interiors have to meet. So let's talk about how it is that we make our books readable. Now, it kind of sounds a little stupid. Well, it's in English. You can read English, can't you? Yeah, but that's not what I mean by readability. What I mean by readability is that the reader is um, seamlessly and almost invisibly guided into the book, the content of the book, in such a way that they don't even notice the design but the design is what is uh, facilitating your reading of the book. Now, some of the things that go into making your book readable, I've got them on the slide. For instance, what font do you use? You want to use a font, and, and let, me, let me just say about fonts, because I always think, gee, people aren't that interested in fonts. Who's interested in fonts? But that's really not true. And I'd like to say that on my blog, which is five years old at this point, uh, the most popular post on my blog is about fonts, and it has been for five years. I didn't really think that was going to happen, but I wrote a post with five different fonts I particularly like for book design. And uh, the fact of the matter is that most designers, like me, I have about 900 fonts on my computer right now as we speak. But there's probably a, less than a dozen that I rely on for typesetting book interiors. They're fonts that everybody knows. They're very uh, comfortable. They're like an old pair of slippers. You, you know, it's just <laughs> easy, easy, easy to read these fonts. They don't create any weird patterns when you get a whole page of type uh, set there. And, and, and that's really smart to use a font that people are comfortable with and they associate with reading books. Uh, the font size comes into how readable it's going to be. Uh, I've given you a range here, somewhere between 10 and 13, but that depends on the font you're using. I often get asked by people for specific recommendations of how they should typeset their book, and I never answer those questions. I've never answered them. And the reason is you can't do it in isolation. I can't tell you, yes, you should set that 11-point type because maybe you're using a font that, that just doesn't look good. Now, another factor that most people don't consider, am amateurs trying to do books, is the line spacing, or what's called letting. And that is the space between lines. One of the biggest problems people have when they're reading a dense page, like a book page, is that you know if the line is very long, like if you have uh, more than about 12 or 15 words on that line, 
People can get confused when they go from the right side of the line back to the left side to read the next line about which line they're on. So that really impacts readability. That book is less readable if you can't tell which line you're on. So adding space between the lines is a really easy way to make your text more readable if you have a layout that will accommodate them. Uh, line length, that's really critical. And uh, we found, uh, because after all, let's face it, we've been designing books for long documents for people to read for about 500 years. So we have a lot of accumulated expertise about what makes books easy to read for readers. And, you know, if you have, if your line length, and I would measure that how many words are on the line rather than in picas or inches or something, you know, it should be between 10 and 15 words on the line. I usually try to aim for about 12 or 13. I just know that that is what people are expecting. It's comfortable, and it makes the book more readable. And the last thing is contrast. And, you know, there have been periods of time in the design world where people have gone to, like, blue type. Uh, there was a big uh, fad years ago for sepia type. It's kind of like dark brown. I don't know if people thought it looked cool or made the book look old. I don't really know. But the lack of contrast with these different colors actually makes a book harder to read. So I would encourage you, um, if your book is all text, just use black type. Don't uh, fall for the artsy look. It's just going to make it harder for your readers to make it through your book. And that is not our aim. Our aim is to make the book readable. So let's look a little more, more detail. <clears throat> now, here's a typeface sample uh, from a typeface called Garriman. This was designed, uh, the original, by a man named Claude Garriman. He was a French type cutter. And uh, over the years, this font has been redesigned many, many times. What we're looking at is a version of uh, Garriman from Adobe. And Garriman may be uh, the most or one of the most well-known and widely used fonts for book design, and it really works well. Now, many people can't tell the difference between fonts, and I totally get that. But in these samples, if you look at the italics, like for instance, as here is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's in italic version of the font, you'll see a big difference between Garriman and uh, Janssen. Janssen, another great font. This is from uh, Nicholas Janssen. And um, you can see here, I'm going to go back and forth once between these. And if you look at the italics here, you'll see what a huge difference there is in these type fonts. They really give a completely different feeling on the page. They're both what we call old style fonts. And that just means that they show the influence of calligraphy more than um, more than more modern fonts. And that tends to make them uh, kind of graceful and easy to read on the page. Here's another font I like, and it's called Caslon. Caslon was uh, the invention of William Caslon, uh, the first book printer in England ever. And that was in the 17th century. This is another font that's been widely used and redrawn over and over again. This is Adobe Caslon. It's their version. It's a very beautiful and just highly, highly usable font. So if you were to use fonts like Garamond or Janssen or Caslon, or if you were to go over my blog and look at that article, that's the most popular article there, the five fonts I recommend for books, you will see these are very standard, graceful, uh, fonts that create a beautiful color on the page. They're very easy to read, and they're what people are used to. And there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, when we're talking book design, you got to remember that what we're here to do is get out of the way between the author and the reader. So the author ideas and words can flow seamlessly to the reader's comprehension. That's our aim. So we don't want to really do a lot of fancy tricks unless the book is about you know, fancy tricks or design initiatives or stuff like that. So that's an example of some of the fonts you can use. And here's my example of why I never give type recommendations on things that I can't see. What you're looking at is two different fonts. The top one is called Minion, and the bottom one is called Microsoft Reference Sans. I typeset both of these in 12-point type. 
they don't look the same, do they? <laughs> one of them looks like almost twice as big as the other one, and they're both 12-point type. So uh, in a vacuum, you cannot determine what the type size should be. You have to look at the specific font, the way it's imposed on the page, the way the page is laid out, and then I could tell you, yeah, that looks okay, or maybe you should make that one point smaller. So that's, that's why I don't give those recommendations. All right, element number two is uh, include user-friendly navigation. What does that mean? It means that you are letting the reader know uh, the anatomy of your book, the importance of various elements in the book, uh, how to find their way in the book. That's what navigating means. For instance, in a very, the most general way, your table of contents represents a schematic of what everything that's in your book, the order it's in your book, what, what is prerequisite, what follows from that. So that's very reader friendly to include a table, a table of contents, and almost all books do. The same could be said for page numbers. Uh, you really need page numbers in your print books. And we also include things that are called running heads or running feet. And those are the little tiny type you see at the top or the bottom of the page. Uh, frequently they'll have the book title, the author's name. It might have the name of the chapter that you're reading. That can be very handy if you put a book down, you come back a couple of days later, you pick it up. You could just glance at the top of the page and say, oh yeah, I'm reading that chapter about the War of 1812. You're right back to where you used to be. I think that's reader friendly. And of course, an index for books that really deserve one uh, is extremely handy and your readers will really thank you. Uh, for instance, if you have a 400 page book about the history of the Peloponnesian Islands, you want to have an index in that book so people can quickly find the information they're looking for. That's what I mean by user-friendly navigation. Now, here are some examples of what I'm talking about. For instance, here are two pages from books. Uh, the top one shows how running heads are used. I don't know if you can see this very well. It's from a book about uh, place name history in Utah. And so the entire uh, so two-volume work is all arranged alphabetically. And so the top of the page shows you exactly which terms are included on that page. At the top right, it says Ash Creek. That's the last uh, entry on the right-hand page. And the left-hand page has the first entry. So right away, by looking at the top of the page, you know exactly which entries are on those pages. At the bottom, you can see a page from a book about uh, payment systems. And this book used running feet instead of heads. In other words, all the same information is included at the bottom. And here you can see it includes the chapter number and the actual title, core systems checking, with the page number. So right in that little spot there, and it's almost unconscious, the reader can find out exactly where they are in the book, what subject they're reading about, what page they're on, and that is very reader friendly. Um, okay, what do you mean about the hierarchy of knowledge? That was my third of my seven points of making your book readable. Now, this mostly applies to nonfiction books, but you know, sometimes you run into it in fiction, and that would be in cases where you have uh, elements, for instance, uh, sometimes people like to include uh, emails in the books, they want to typeset those differently. Or we might have what we call parallel text streams. In other words, I'm telling a story, but I'm also using material from an earlier time that parallels that story. We have to differentiate where these things fall in the hierarchy of knowledge. And for instance, in my little bullet list here, you can see that this is a hierarchy. It starts with the book title. Then you might have a title of one part of the book, then the chapter titles. And each of these is a subset of the one above them. Our section heads, uh, and most nonfiction books have A-level heads. Some of them have A and B-level heads. Some of them have A, B, and C-level heads. At this point, it becomes quite a challenge for the, the book designer to adequately design these so the reader will instantly know what it is they're looking at and where this information falls in that hierarchy of knowledge. And here's my example. 
And this is a real page from a book about, uh, it's a kind of a legal book about uh, trustees and foundations. And you can see right on this one page, we have this hierarchy showing, the chapter number. Um, and here is actually the chapter title. And uh, it looks like these, uh, my labels on the left have shifted a little bit. But uh, basically, chapter 23 is the chapter number. Trustee meetings is the chapter title, so it's bigger. The subhead A is our trustee meeting specifically required. So that has to be smaller, subservient to chapter title. Sub B, where the trustee meetings held, has to be subordinate to sub A. And way down at the bottom, who holds the gavel? That has to be subordinate to sub B and sub A. And they all have to be consistent throughout the book. So this is what I mean by the reader being able to instantly understand what the hierarchy of knowledge is and where each piece fits. This shouldn't be really too hard for authors to understand who write these kind of books because many authors write them from an outline and the outline actually is comprised of these subheads. And then we go in and write the material to uh, populate each area uh, under each subhead. So that's the hierarchy of knowledge. Uh, moving right along, let's go to Number, let's see, it helps if you press the right button I found. Okay, number four. Another uh, way to make your book readable is to uh, make sure that you've given easy access for your readers to resources that they might need to understand your book, your topic, or to look outside for more information. Do you include footnotes? You can either do them as footnotes at the bottom of the page, you could do them as uh, notes at the end of a chapter. You can accumulate them all in the back of the book in a notes section. And uh, the decision you make about how to treat your notes is really specific to each book and how your reader's going to use it. In some cases, one method's better. In uh, some cases, another method's better. And uh, these can be really, really important parts of nonfiction books because that's where you're really showing that you have surveyed the literature, that you understand the whole field you're writing in, and that you are referring back to other noted people in your field. Now, if you have notes in your book, you're probably going to need to have a bibliography, and that's where you list the actual sources that all those things came from. Uh, I already mentioned an index, but that is also belongs in this category, because any kind of uh, complicated book is going to require an index, uh, and your readers probably almost demand it. In some cases, we also include a glossary, and a glossary is simply a listing of specialized terms with their explanations. So if you're using terms like I already used in this webinar, I use the word letting, for instance. Most people don't know what letting means, and if I was writing a book about book design, then I would have a glossary, and I would say letting is the space between the lines. Now, I might then stop and tell you an interesting historical story about the actual pieces of lead we used to put between the lines of metal type, and that that's where the name of leading came from. And, uh, you know, when you handle those pieces of lead, you kind of end up with your hands all black at the end of the day, um, because <laughs> that's the way lead is. But, uh, you know, at least in the glossary, I can tell you what letting means, and uh, you will have a much better uh, chance of gaining that uh, information of the special jargon or language used in that specific field of knowledge. So I think that's um, all of those things are really good for the right kinds of books. <clears throat> now here's my tongue twister, extra textural elements, and that's, that's really hard to say. Okay, so what are extra textural elements? Well, think of them of all the things that aren't included in the main narrative or the main text of the book. And that includes things like sidebars where we have uh, pieces of text out in the margins to help uh, elucidate a certain point that's being made in the text. We might pull actual quotes from the text to highlight them, and we call those pull quotes. We might also use quotations from other sources. If they run longer than a line or two, then we uh, treat them separately and we call them extracts. I'm going to show you an example of that. 
Uh, tables are frequently used. For instance, that book that I showed you earlier on payment system is just filled with tables. And tables are just a convenient way of organizing information. They could be all words, numbers, doesn't matter. But uh, they are the uh, main way that we organize what we call tabular material. Charts and graphs also uh, are frequent in uh, business books and historical books, many other kinds of books. And uh, there, the, the important thing is uh, not only readability, but having them located at the right spot in the book so they're right there where the reader needs them when they hit that point in the book. And the other thing we see a lot of this day is uh, stuff being added to the ends of chapters. Uh, action steps you can take to act on this, or summary of what you just read that reiterates the main points, or it might give you uh, ways to practice uh, what you just learned about and put it into action. So uh, let's take a look at some of those. Now here, uh, this is in fact from the same book, I believe, on uh, trustees and foundations. Here we've uh, taken a particular item that people need to know and we put it into a sidebar. And it's called a sidebar because it's kind of off on the side. And you can see the main text flows around it. Uh, this is really effective for print books. We don't generally recommend doing this on a book that you're going to convert into an ebook because these sidebars are going to create some handwork for you and you, you have a couple of hundred of them in your book. Uh, it can really add to the expense of converting that book to an ebook. But for a print book, this is a really good looking way to uh, highlight sidebar type information. Now, uh, here's an extract. In other words, this is a quote taken from another source that runs more than a line or so. In this case, it's about uh, five lines. So we treat it differently typographically, and we do this to show the reader that this is something different from what you were just reading. And the uh, visual representation of the extract uh, shows that perfectly. You know, we know immediately that we're now reading something from another source. Uh, and this is an example, uh, this was just one I pulled out of a book I had done recently, uh, where the author wanted to uh, have at the end of every part of the book what he called pause your machinery. And he's talking about mindfulness and uh, taking it into everyday life. And so in these sections, he provides you with practical examples of things you can actually do to put into practice what he just talked about in that part of the book. And these get added to the end of each chapter or each part. Moving right along, we are up to number six. Number six, and this is really important, and I'm going to tell you why it's important. You know, I have a friend who started self-publishing a few years ago, and he had published books with traditional publishers before. And uh, when he first started doing his own books, you know, he sent me a copy, and, and I wrote back to him. I said, this is very crazy. You've got page numbers on the, on, on the wrong places. You, you just It was just non-standard. It was like a lot of weird things going on. And I said, why did you do that? And he said, well, it's my book, and I'm the publisher, and I can do anything I want. Well, that's true. Couldn't say that isn't true. But is that really going to give you the best chance of making your book a success? And it isn't. And here's why. You rely, even if you're an indie author like me, you rely on a lot of other people to help you market your book and get it out to uh, the attention of all the people that it could potentially benefit. Most of the people who are going to be looking at your book and evaluating it are book professionals. They could be book reviewers. They could be book buyers at a bookstore. They could be bookers on a, a media source, a TV station. They're people who look at books all day, every day. They know what a book is supposed to look like, even if you don't. And things that are wrong with your book from the point of view of not conforming to industry standards will pop out like a sore thumb. And what message are you going to give to somebody who's very experienced in looking at books if you've numbered your pages incorrectly, you know, and you've got page one on the left and page two on the right? You never want to do that. The message you're going to give them is 
hey, this book was produced by an amateur, and because of that, there's no particular reason to, um, to, to, to guarantee that the information itself is going to be reliable or that it's been verified or it's been checked or that it was edited. You know, you're just kind of advertising your book as an amateur production. That is not the way to get a good result in the market. So uh, types of things you have to look out for is to make sure the elements are in the right order. Do you know if the preface comes before the introduction or after the acknowledgments? Hey, well, I got news for you. I actually wrote a reference on this, and I keep it next to my desk because I don't always remember all that stuff, and neither are you. So get a good reference. I happen to have one that's available for free. I will tell you about that later. Uh, and keep it next to you when you're creating books. It will guide you through the process. Make sure you number your pages correctly. This is a simple error that too many people make, and it's completely unnecessary. If you open a book, page one is the first thing you're going to see. That's a right-hand page. So every odd page in your book has to be a right-hand page. There are no exceptions. Uh, use the page numbering conventions. And we do this for specific reasons. In other words, you'll notice that sometimes books in the front have those little funny Roman numerals, and the rest of the book has regular numbers, Arabic numerals. Why is that? Well, it was, it's that way because uh, the text of the book is frequently produced separately from the front matter or the beginning of the book, and we don't want the page numbers in the text of the book to be affected by our adding or subtracting material in the front matter. So if we number them separately, uh, we never have that problem. Like if I have a book with two pages of testimonials and I want to add two more pages of testimonials, it's not going to disturb the page numbering of the book itself at all because the page number is going to start on the first page of the introduction with page number one. And uh, here's the last thing to look out for, and that's blank pages. And, and this is maybe the most common mistake I see in self-published books. Uh, maybe it's because people don't know how to use Word. They can't get that running head off that page. They just don't know how to do it, so they just leave it there. And uh, that's an egregious error. If you, if you have a page in the book that's blank, that means that there's no text on the page. It's not actually part of the text of the book at all. So if it's blank, it's got to be totally blank. And I only want to see paper on that page, nothing else. No page numbers, no running heads, no nothing. Blank paper. So, I've arrived at number seven, and that is that uh, your book needs to meet certain production imperatives. And an imperative is a command, and, and that is exactly what I mean. Now, when you planned your book, uh, you really, that's the time to make sure that the way you're marketing the book, and by that I mean how the book will be presented and who it will be presented to, the format it will be presented in are all things that are um, expected by your target audience. So your production has to meet your marketing needs. And the marketing needs should really drive the production decisions you make. Now, not a lot of self-published authors think about that when they first think about writing a book. And I get that. They're excited about writing their book. But this is very important to take into consideration. I'm going to explain why. Uh, your production method needs to accommodate the kind of book you're producing. And I have an alert here, for instance. And this is very funny. I just talked to somebody yesterday with this exact problem. He had a novel, and the novel is going to page out at between 750 and 800 pages. Now, that is just simply a disaster when it comes to print on demand, which is the way we're, most of us are doing these books. And that's how we, most of the books going through Ingram are done. And that's what Spark is so great at, is print on demand. So for instance, you remember the Harry Potter books? This is a shot of our family Harry Potter collection. You can tell they're pretty well read. But look at the size of these things. This is the kind of book my client was trying to produce. Now, I love Harry Potter books. I've read them all. And you know, those 800-page Harry Potter books, they weren't too long. 
you were having such a good time reading it, you just didn't want it to end. It could have been a thousand or fifteen hundred. Let's keep going. But the problem is to try to produce a, a seven hundred and fifty page novel by print on demand is probably not going to be a good idea. The reason is that there are real limits on what people will pay for certain kinds of books. People have expectations, and for a novel, they're not going to pay uh, $30 for a paperback novel. But that's probably what you would have to charge, because while print on demand has many great advantages, it does come with a somewhat of a, a cost penalty. So when we're planning our books, this is really, really important to understand what is, you know, to really um, plan out your book all the way through to what you're going to charge for the book, how much profit you're going to make on the book, how much it's going to cost you to produce the book, what discount you're going to have to give to your retail and wholesale partners to get them to carry the book, and then work that all backwards. Now, in this client's um, case, it turned out that the book was actually in two very discrete parts. And the client was actually very happy in the end to realize that he could create two books from his manuscript, have a much better shot at making a profit at it, and have two books to promote instead of one. So it was really a happy story when he realized that getting the production and marketing matrix to line up meant that he would have a much, much better chance to succeed. So that's part of book design also. The other kind of book, uh, parenthetically, that I frequently get requests from self-publishers is they say, you know, I want to do this as one of those little uh, gift books that you always see on the counter at the bookstore, and they're in those little cardboard cartons, which are called dumps, by the way. And, um, you know, I want to sell it for $5.99, and just everybody in the world is going to buy it. And I have to tell them, look, you can't do that book unless you've got a lot of money and a whole team going out there to market this to bookstores all over the country. That is a loser. The publishers who produce those little, cute, full-color, inspirational books you see on the, in the counter dumps in the bookstore, you know, they're printing 20 or 30,000 at a time, and they're paying for it up front. I don't think as a self-publisher you want to put yourself in that position. So you have to find a different way to deliver that information. All right, so we've been through the seven things that we want your book interior to achieve. Uh, to be successful. So what are the options you have for doing this? Well, quite quickly, you could do it yourself and look, more power to you. You can hire a professional book designer. Uh, that sounds like a good idea, particularly if your book is complicated. You can hire a formatter. We've got a lot of those people around these days. And number four, I've got a different alternative for you. So number one, you could do it yourself. There's no reason you can't do it. Uh, you're going to need some fonts. You're going to need some reference books. Uh, you're going to need some books from your shelf, probably, on the bookshelf behind you. You've got lots of books that were produced by publishing industry professionals. Go and look at them. Study them. See exactly what they did. You can use, uh, I use Adobe InDesign. You can use Quark Express, and both of those are going to give you great typography. And look, a lot of authors are using Microsoft Word. Kind of sounds crazy. It did to me a few years ago, but now I understand that that is really the tool of choice for many authors. Now, if you want to do it yourself, it really works well. If you, basically, it's a fairly simple book, like a novel, you know, which might have chapters. Other than that, it's just a running narrative. A memoir is very similar. Essay, if you think about it from the point of view of formatting, it's pretty similar. Just text with an occasional break for a chapter title, a chapter number, or an essay title. Those kind of books, you could do those. And uh, you are going to have to do some research, get that software, and figure out how it all works. But I'm here to tell you, a lot of people have done it themselves very successfully. And uh, you know, if you do it yourself, you might want to ask somebody who's more knowledgeable in how books are done to just look over your proof before you go to press. Another option is you can hire a pro. And there's a lot of them out there. There are some books you really, really want to have a professional. And I've indicated some of them on the slide here. And the reason for this is that if you're doing a very highly complex book, you know, do yourself a favor. It's going to drive you crazy. And you're not really going to be sure if it's right at the end or not. 
So hiring a professional is really a good idea, and there are many ways to do that. You can, uh, the, and the book designers, of course, they work with uh, both print-on-demand vendors and short-run offset book printers all day, every day. That's what they do. They can advise you. They can help you communicate with the printer. Printers generally are not that user-friendly, not like Ingram Spark, where they really know authors and love them. They're book printers. They're, you know, they're uh, manufacturers. And if you have a book that really requires high-quality color reproduction, that's probably going to be printed overseas. You're going to be dealing with a print broker. And, you know, these are industry insiders. And in that case, it's really, really helpful to have a book designer on your team to interface with the printers, the brokers, to decide on paper choices, binding choices, picking printers, and then uh, overseeing the brokers who are going to deal with them overseas because we probably don't speak Chinese or Korean or Japanese, and we can't deal with the book printers. So those are all cases where you really might want to hire a pro. Another option you have is to hire a formatter. We have a lot of these people around now calling themselves book formatters, and uh, basically that's the layout part of the design job. The designer designs the book. They could then turn it over to somebody else to actually do the page-by-page -page layout to execute the design. And you just have to be, uh, uh, there's nothing to matter with hiring formatters, and uh, you just have to be aware that they don't actually design stuff. They're not going to give you design services, but they can take care of that, you know, what some people consider the drudgery of doing the page by page, breaking the pages, putting in the heads, doing the styling. That's what a formatter will do for you. Now, the fourth option is to use a book template. And um, there are big publishers who uh, have used book templates, uh, and I don't see anything wrong with it. And uh, if I have time, I'm going to tell you a short story now because I'm getting near the end and I want to leave time for your questions. But at one point in my book design practice, I decided to start offering this option to my clients. And remember, these were all people who came and hired me, paid a premium price to get their book done by somebody who knows what they're doing. And I said, I did this for about a year. And at each time, I said, would you like to go through this design process or would you rather use a template uh, from one of my uh, unused book designs. It'll be completely unique to you, and um, it'll save about two weeks off the process and about a third of the expense. So I offered that over and over again to clients for a year, and I want to report to you the results of that survey. The results were 100% of the people I asked said, yeah, give me the template. Okay. So uh, for a long time, I've really wanted to bring this ability to, because templates allow you to format a book really quickly as opposed to going through a whole design process. And that really attracted me to put that into the hands of um, in the authors. So back in 2013, Tracy Atkins and I got together and we started creating from my book designs Microsoft Word templates that actually turn your manuscript into a book in like no time flat. It's really fast. You can see on this slide um, three of the designs that we've made available for Ingram Spark authors at a special discounted price. And in fact, uh, Spark has been kind enough to put the URL to the page where we actually uh, sell these at the bottom of the slide, you can see it there, book design templates at lead pages slash Ingram Spark. And what the template allows you to do is to uh, take your text, pour it into the Word template, and end up with a book that avoids all of those mistakes we were talking about. The templates are industry standard. Uh, they accommodate many different kinds of books. As you can see here, we have uh, plain text. We have books with illustrations, and that photo could be a chart or a graphic of some kind, whatever you could drop into that box. And we also have ones that are actually photo-oriented books, if that's the kind of books you're producing. Um, here are some more. These templates allow you to create quickly an industry standard book with great readability. The type fonts come with the templates themselves, so you know that when you create your book from the template, 
it's going to look exactly like the sample that you will see on that page. And by the way, if you go to this page, you'll be able to see uh, full-size samples of each of these. All of these fonts are supplied completely legally. They're all fully uh, licensed for you to use in your own books. You have no worries about font usage. You have no worries about, um, about uh, your book uh, having the page numbers on the wrong pages. We've completely eliminated all those problems for you. I want to also point out that when you hit that page, you're also going to see some of our author toolkits that we've been producing lately. And these have been tremendously popular, and I know exactly why. And I'll just talk about one of them, and then we're going to go to questions. And that is our Media Kit Template Bundle. Uh, we've had hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of authors buy this Media Kit because every author knows that the media is who will help them sell books. But very few authors know how to interact with the media, how to put together a media kit, what should be in it, how you should say it. We teamed up with publicity specialist Joan Stewart, a friend of mine, and she has put all of her years of expertise into the guidance in this package. This is a set of Microsoft Word templates for every conceivable piece you might need in your media kit. All you do is open it up. Joan tells you exactly what to put in each place and why. You fill it in. There are completed samples for everything so you can see what it's supposed to look like at the end. And so these, uh, all of these toolkits, Book Watch Toolkit, our blog post template bundle, these are all ways of cutting down on uncertainty, saving time, saving money, the expense of doing something wrong, and really, the whole aim is to help authors get a better result from all the work they've already put into their books. Come on, writing the book is the hard part. I think you know, producing your book and marketing it should be more fun than sitting in a room writing, rewriting, and rewriting. Uh, I've got one more slide here. Advice for indie publishers. And this is really good advice. Uh, this webinar is going to be made available as a replay. You can study this all uh, in your own time. You can um, make sure you've uh, absorbed the advice for indie authors. But right now, what I'd like to do is to see if we have any questions uh, that we can use the last eight minutes of our webinar time together answering. Hey, Joel. It's Kristen again. Um, so I think what, what I'll do is um, I've got a couple of questions that I've flagged here that I thought were good, and then um, I can read Tracy's answers, and then if you want to elaborate um, or, you know, kind of um, add to it, then that would be great. Um, so one we had is uh, with nonfiction, what is the best format for adding JPEG, pic JPEG pictures to a book? Um, and, and Tracy had answered, uh, use a 300 DPI image that is sized correctly for the image space. You should have no JP, JPEG compression if for print and modest compression for ebook. Any Anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, well, Tracy is a, a technologist and knows this stuff inside out, and he's exactly right. And the thing that most people have trouble understanding there, Kristen, is the whole thing about 300 DPI. And, you know, uh, we're constantly getting books sent to us with uh, images people have grabbed off the screen of their computer. But the images on the screen of your computer are 72 dots per inch. That's the way yeah. your screen displays them. But when we go to print books, we need to have an image that's 300 dots per inch at the size it's going to be printed at. And that's the thing people seem to have trouble making the leap. So I'll give you an example. Suppose you're doing a six by nine book and you want an image that's going to be the full type width. Well, in a six by nine book, let's say the width of the type is about four inches, roughly, and I'm rounding off here. So you want your image to be four inches wide and it has to be 300 dots per inch. So that means it has to be a, a minimum of 1200 dots or 1200 pixels wide, okay? That's how you can see and calculate if your image has enough resolution to print properly. 
if you send in a book with low resolution images in it, likely what's going to happen is the printer is going to reject your book or Spark uh, your, is going to get in touch with you and say, uh, your book failed our, uh, our pre-flight because the images are too low resolution. So then you've got to stop and start doing it over again. So the, 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 the smart thing to do is to make sure when you're planning your book that you actually can get 300 dots per inch or DPI images uh, for the, the whatever graphics you want to show in the book. Frequently, you, you can't get them because, like I say, people are just grabbing the stuff off the screen somewhere, and there is no high-resolution version. So you want to know that up front, and that's a great question. Thank you. Um, got another good one, I think. Um, uh, I've used Joel's templates for cover and interior, and it's been a pleasure to work with them. A question about book covers. What is the trick to making a good-looking cover when the book title is longer than two to three words? Yes, there is a trick to that, and the trick is called typography. And that is a person who is skilled at typography, and that is the artful arrangement of type, uh, will know exactly how to handle that for the particular book. Now, consider this question. We know nothing about the title of the book. We know nothing about what genre it's in. We know nothing about the intended audience. We don't know what the subtitle is. We don't know if the author's name is five words long or one word long. We, and we don't know anything about the visuals. So we cannot really answer a question like this in, the, in, in a vacuum, okay? Um, but you, if you had a situation like that and you, it's really confounding you, I would hire a professional cover designer. They will know exactly how to deal with that. If you're determined to do it yourself and you want to uh, just figure it out, then what you're going to have to do is head down to the bookstore and start looking at hundreds and hundreds of books. This is what I do, and I've been doing this all my life, and I still do it. I go down to the bookstore, mm -hmm. and I start pulling books off the shelf. Uh, and uh, you're going to inevitably, within uh, 10 minutes, you're going to find a number of examples of books with long titles. And uh, you know, you'll see there are lots of different ways to solve that particular problem, depending on the book and the intended market. Good question, though. That's a really good answer, Joel. Um, I, I, uh, I just think that you have given us a master class here today, and um, it, it's kind of like a TED Talk, really. And, you know, I, I love as a former book designer myself to um, actually, you know, dig into Garamond and Caslon and extracts and sidebars and all of that. It, it was just um, – really a phenomenal presentation and I will tell you that um, we are delighted to be um, working with Joel and uh, especially the templates that he offers it as he said it solves so many problems in terms of uh, creating you know the interior of your files in a very easy and very affordable Joel didn't mention that but very affordable um, way to create your book, and so I encourage you to really uh, uh, look at his templates and uh, use them for your own books. <clears throat> Anything else you want to say before we sign off here, Joel? Well, that's a good point, Robin, and I'll just emphasize that because, I mean, you could hire me to design your book, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. You don't want to do that because you probably have a very limited budget. You could hire a, a younger book designer. You could hire a formatter. But uh, there's no way, if you have the uh, gumption uh, to, to uh, try this yourself, one of our templates is going to cost you somewhere between $30 and $50. I, it just, I can't make it any cheaper, Robin. I tried, but... The, no, I know. If you are willing to put in a couple of hours, particularly if you're a novelist, it's not going to take you long. Uh, to format your book using these templates, and you're going to assure yourself that you've got a good product going out the door. Yes, and they and they work well. They work well in Spark too. That's the other point that we want to make here. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to uh, wrap everyone up. Um, we're at our time limit here. Um, uh, Joel, one quick way: if people have additional questions, what is the best way to get in touch with you? Oh, absolutely easy. Go to my blog at thebookdesigner.com, 
and it's very easy to find, or you can go to bookdesigntemplates.com. On both sites, there's a menu that says contact. Just fill out the contact form with your question. You will get an answer. Great. Um, and then I also want to let everyone know that we have recorded the webinar. You'll receive an email um, in, within 48 hours with the re recording, and then it will also be hosted on the Ingram Spark YouTube channel uh, for future reference. Um, I want to thank both Robin and Joel for joining us today. This was extremely helpful and useful information, um, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, we will we'll catch you next month um, and be on the lookout for what that um, topic will be and when it will be hosted. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.